Want a quick update from Jordan? How hard for Christ? Yeah, yeah. Can you give us a quick update, quick testimony? Quick testimony on what? What happened this Saturday? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, sorry for the hat here. Um, thank you, Brian Joyce. That's not Joyce. I'm gonna pick you out. There she is, Joyce. And um, everybody else who came, uh, it was a great event. Since I did, I forgot about the Josh. Josh, <laughs> I'm still learning names, so forgive me. Um, it was a great event. I'm figuring it was on like the first weekend of the state fair, which I totally forgot about. So, all our church went to the state fair, but <laughs> Harvester came out and represented it, and it was awesome. Um, which is kind of messed up for our church, but Harvester, thank you. <laughs> uh, we had a few cars come out, and it was they. It was like dope rides and everything. And then we had e Fetty. They came did her thing. And act- afterwards, we had, um, I spoke. And I was preaching to the youth, but uh, the, I brought out a man to help out because I was doing like a drama s- type thing so they could actually see it. And afterwards, he kind of came to me after and said, I really needed this. And now he's trying to find a local church. And I was like, what? You, you grown, but hey, whatever. <laughs> so, hey, it worked out, and we touched at least one life, which that's all. For me, that's a success. And now we, the there's a guy named Hung, Hung Phantasm. You may or may not know him. I don't know. You know, uh, He has a car shop in Capitol Boulevard. Well, he was our judge, and I don't think he's a Christian, and I, I don't know. But he stayed the whole time after he said he wants to make this a bigger and better a bigger thing, and he's going to talk to his people on his side, and if we just keep bringing in the artists, we keep bringing the word, then he'll keep doing his thing. I was like, okay, that works for me. So he's basically going to introduce, he's going to help us introduce Christianity to his whole car culture, which is like a whole nother. Yes, and then we had Kenneth, who was another guy who came out. So he wanted to say, hey, can H4C do something about skateboarding? So I was like, yeah, sure. So we had a meeting today. He said, okay, this is what I want. And he had this whole plan. I was like, whoa, I've, I got school, man. He said, no, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it. So he wants to go to all the skate parks and have skate events. And then he said, yeah, you preach, and I'll, I'll take care of the skateboarders, and we'll do this. Thing. I was like, what? All right. So, so we have a tour coming up next, starting – Next year, we're going all of North Carolina skate parks. And then he said, yeah, and I got some people. Dan, Dan Murphy, he's a pro skater. Justin, somebody who is also a pro skater. He said, yeah, I have, they have friends for him. So we'll go up to his house, and we'll do this. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so I'm just going to see what God does next. Thank you. That's awesome. Oh. Amen. Amen. Uh, I just want to recognize um, Hyunbin and Choni. I think they're really experiencing the presence of God. Hyunbin, what's the name of the Halle? Okay, you're a little scared. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, God loves, God loves children. And God really wants his children to know him. And his heart desires so much to see little children come to know to the saving knowledge of Christ. They're, ne- they're never too young or we're never too old. So we think, can we just pray for them? I mean, just, it's so significant. They leave tomorrow. And for them to experience so much of God's love tonight, it's not an accident, but it's a design, a loving hand of God. So they don't know that they don't know that yeah? Oh, amen. <laughs> Can we just really pray for them that God will seal what he's done in their lives, that he He loves his children so much. Amen. 
God, you are somebody who's not far away, but somebody so close. You're not somebody who's scary, but so loving. 무서운 분이 아니고 사랑하시는 분입니다. 이 사랑으로 우리 존이 현빈이 만져주신 하나님 감사합니다. 이 모든 하나님이 하신 일이 이곳에서 성령님으로 보혈로서 덮어질 수 있도록 인도해 주시고 We pray that Lord all that work that you have done will be covered in the blood of the Lamb. The Lord Jesus no weapon that's formed against them shall prosper. For Lord Jesus for it is your good pleasure to see Lord your people come to the saving knowledge of Christ no matter how old they are. And Lord Jesus, as Sean Bin is shedding those tears, and Joan, Lord, is shedding those tears, God, of the reality of the presence of God. Lord, they may not have the language to speak your name, but Lord God, we pray that they will be able to know that it is the person of Jesus Christ. That the Ajaktari Sean Bin and Joan, I don't know who they are, but I pray that they will be able to see Jesus Christ in their hearts. I pray that they will be able to see Jesus Christ in their hearts. I pray that they will be able to see Jesus Christ in their hearts. 덮어주시고 이곳에서 하나님 아버지가 어떻게 마귀의 권세가 덤벼들어도 하나님 아버지 사랑으로서 물리칠 수 있는 힘을 주시고 모든 것을 예수님으로 기도합니다. 아멘 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 Praise God And as we've been talking about in Genesis Genesis 3 um, We talked about how people have walked away from God And one thing that I really feel deeply, 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 deeply convicted about is that the sin of rebellion is not us making bad choices. The sin against God is not us making bad choices from the good choices is presented to us. It's not making the right choice that's the way to salvation versus making a bad choice that's the way to, to the path of the enemy. But the truth is, the choice that we make independent of God itself is the sin. The fact that we make choices apart from God, upon, according to our own desires, according to our own thinking, in itself is sin and rebellion against God. And this is what this generation, more than any other generation, perhaps is stuck on. It's the fact that we make choices independent of anybody else and says, this is my choice. You have no right to tell me otherwise. And that attitude is paving its way to hell. And so this today, church, can we begin to recognize it in ourselves? The fact that we are not making bad choices because we are the influences, but we make bad choices because we are apart from God. And every bad choice that we make is because we are independent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so right now, can we begin to stand on the truth that it is not my choice, but it is the truth of God that works through me through which I must make all choices. So at this moment, can we begin to just declare and understand that, Lord, my life is not my own to lead or make choices of. Lord, it is your choice and help us to surrender ourselves so fully to you, so completely giving ourselves away to the reality of God without which we will die. So Lord Jesus, we pray, we pray, Pray against the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of independence. And Lord Jesus, we declare in this place, spirit of absolute and utter dependence upon the love of the Father that is shown through Jesus Christ. So we say thank you. Thank you for that love. Thank you so that we don't have to fight, that we can rest in that ever faithful, ever consistent, never turning away, never giving up, never doubting kind of love that supports and upholds us. So we say yes to that love. We say yes, God, to that love. We say yes to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the church said, amen, amen. So the history of the Bible is the history of Genesis 3 being 
unfolding before our eyes because we talked about Genesis 3 last week encapsulating the entirety of the gospel in its entirety. It's the microcosmic representation of the full range of the fall of humankind and God's pursuit of us who never gives up on us. And as I was preaching last week, we asked the question, God, why do you not give up on us? As Yena articulated so beautifully, why do you not give up on us? Because God says, I do not know how. This is who I am. My love demands that I pursue you to the very end, unto the last dying breath. And this love is where we are sitting within the sauna of this love. <laughs> and the Warmth that you feel, maybe physically as well as this warm, fuzzy feeling inside or this kind of gentle weight that's in this room. It's not some broken air conditioning unit, but it is the actual presence of God. The Shekinah glory, when we talk about it in the Old Testament, is translated as weight. Something when the glory of God comes, when it inevitably comes when the presence of God is here, is always manifest in the sense of weight or presence. It's tangible. You can feel it. As T said, you can taste it. You can smell it. You can feel it. You can live it. So can we just soak in, in that glory for a moment? Can we just soak in that? Just sit with it and let that weight of God Begin to transform something in within and give yourself away to that. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. And so what we see is that Genesis 3 begins to unfold the pursuit of God for the restoration of all of humanity. But when we see Genesis 3.15, what we heard was what? Genesis 3.15 was what? It's the gospel. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> it is the gospel itself. Genesis 3.15 is the full encapsulation of the gospel saying that God will, through the seed of a woman, will crush serpents head, destroying its power, talking about the resurrection, overturning and overcoming the power of death in the name of Jesus. And then we see the cross event where serpent strikes at the heel of Jesus, of that seed of the woman. And Jesus or God declares this truth over all of creation, and we began to see the entirety of its history unfolding within Scripture, and it continues to unfold today within our lives. This is the truth. But also, if you think about it in a kind of reversed way, we also know that Satan heard that very story as well. When God declared that truth and saying, Woman's seed is going to crush your head. Satan also heard that too. And Satan, ever since then, has been trying to dry up and to kill the seed of the woman. And this is the history of Scripture, and this is the history of the world. And I will demonstrate this in a real quick order. When we see in Egypt, when Pharaoh declares that all firstborn male to be killed, it is because it's the words of Satan being spoken through Pharaoh trying to stop this genealogy of God's work in the world to be stopped so that the work of Satan can continue. And we see that in whether in Jesus' time when um, Herod declares to all the firstborn child or male-born ch children two years or younger to be killed is also this work of Satan. And I want to suggest to you also the work of Holocaust itself is the way that Satan is trying to dry up the seed of Eve. And when we see so much death of young people, today there's a shooting in the state of Washington where a teen, a freshman high school player, went into his high school and started shooting up his high school 
our classmates, that again is this expression of seed of Satan, or Satan trying to dry up the seed of the woman. And John 10, 10 tells us so clearly, Satan comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And this is what we are involved in. This is the work of God in the world to bring salvation to us. God's absolute and relentless pursuit of you. And Satan's relentless pursuit of you to tell you to turn. And so this is the story we find ourselves in. And this is the story that we find in Genesis 4. And when we talk about Cain and Abel, this is a very familiar story to most of us, but we want to read it from fresh lens. And we'll read from uh, Genesis 4, 1 through 8. So turn with me to Genesis 4, verses 1 through 8. Okay, I trust that you found it, and let us read it together. Adam made love to his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Amen. I thought about titling this sermon message, Crouching Sin and Hidden. But I thought, <laughs> but I, don't, I thought maybe you guys were too young to understand that reference. Yeah. It was a movie in the 90s, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. You know, thank you. Thank you, T. Yeah, thank you. But, yeah, I thought I will lose you guys. So, um, so I mean, there's no, there's no title for the sermon other than um, Cain and Abel and what is acceptable worship. But, <laughs> thank you. Older brothers and sisters makes me feel better. Um, but, so, what we know is that, again, if that's the framework of where Satan is trying to undo the work of God in history through the genealogy because he knows what's coming to him because it's the word of God. He knows the character of God and God is faithful. He knows what's coming. So what he must do is to then dry up the seed of Eve. And so what he does in this incidence is that he dries up the seed of Jesus through a killing of Abel. How do we know that? You look at Genesis 4.25. Why don't we look at there again? So Genesis 4.25. Amen. Genesis 4.25. Let's read it together. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since killing killed him. Amen. And so, you know, we see that Adam and Eve and had more children and how many children did adam and eve have five you say five a lot yeah tons well how do we know well this word um you know uh cont is this made love it's, it's a continuous form so they continue to make love and so it means that they continue to make love for over 900 years however old they were and then they continue to have children <laughs> I'm sorry, this is the Bible. All right, uh, so, um, and so what that means is there are literally, I don't know how many children there are, you know, and so if you imagine, just imagine, and so they were having children, they were having more children, so there were tons and tons of children. So anyway, but what we see is that God uh, gave 
Adam and Eve, a replacement. Seth means in place of, right? Did you know that? In place of something. And so what God was giving to Eve was in place of, of Abel, something in replacement. But the question becomes, what is that in replacement of? And to that, we have to go to genealogy of Jesus. Luke chapter 3, verses 23, 23 and verses 38. Luke chapter 3, verses 23 and 38. Luke chapter 3, verses 23 and verses, verse 38. 3, 23 and 38. So Jesus called them over to him. That's Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Luke 3. Luke 23, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was son, he was a son, so he was thought of Joseph, the son of Eli, son of blah, 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 and then all the way to 30, 38, which goes on and on and on. And all these things are really important, but we're not going to talk about any of it except verses 38, verse 38. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, son of God. So what we see in the genealogy of Jesus, the third person in that genealogy is who? Seth. So he becomes the forefather of Jesus himself. And so the reason why Satan kills Abel is because he knows that Seth, is, or I'm sorry, Abel is supposed to be a great, great, great uh grandparent of Jesus himself and trying to dry out that seed is what Satan was trying to do in uh, through Cain and so we see that Seth was in replacement of Abel to be a forerunner or forefather of Jesus and so amen all right um and so um yeah and we see that in uh I mean that's just the background of what Genesis 4 is, right? So it's the, uh, it's the continuation of Genesis 3, the unfolding history of God's salvation, salvific work in the world, and Satan's trying to undo that work in history. And this is going on right now, right? This is going on in your lives where Satan is trying to destroy the work of God in your life. And so we must begin to recognize that and begin to crush Satan underfoot in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So what we see is that in verse 3 of chapter 4, that Cain and Abel brought offering to God. And, but what we can deduce from this passage is that Adam and Eve taught Cain and Abel how to worship, which was great. But not all worships are created equal. And this is what we're going to talk about today. The way that we understand acceptable worship that God accepts through the examples of Cain and Abel. And we're going to talk about five different ways that God is uh, pleased with the way we worship. Five different points. So if we can begin to maybe take notes, because I think this is really important for our generation, because we do not know how to worship properly. And I really think this is a divine moment where I really think that our passage really is speaking prophetically to us, saying that this is how we need to take posture of worship. So first, we see in verse 4, Abel's offering versus Cain's. We all know the consequences of what happens. God accepts Abel's offering but rejects Cain's. But the question is, why does he reject it? Because both of them brought offerings and fruits of their labor. And it's not very clear, but we must, we can deduce from Scripture some basic points. So if you turn with me to 4, 3, and 4, let us read it one more time. Genesis 4, verses 3 and 4. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Amen. And so what we could tell is that when he's talking about Cain's offering, it just says it was a fruit 
of his labor from the land. But of Abel, he said, he brought fat portions of the first fruit. And I think this word uh, fat is in, um, I'm sorry, the first fruit in Hebrew is word beko, <laughs> which means the best. So what we see is that Abel's offering to God, not just a religious duty, but he's preparing what is the best and what is the first. And it was opposed to Cain, who brings an offering that was almost like an afterthought. Because he's been taught to worship God, so he does worship by offering his fruits. But it doesn't say anything about the nature of his offering because his nature of that offering was nondescript because there was no thought behind what Cain offered. It was simply conformity to a religious ritual. He's saying, I must do this because mommy and daddy told me to do it. I must go to church, so I'm going to show up and sit in the church pews and listen to this boring preacher talk for an hour and a half, and then I'm going to go home. But I'm going to please God with that. But this, what we're seeing in Scripture, does not please God. Because worship that God accepts and worship that pleases Him is worship that has been planned, that gives and that focus is in giving Him what is the best and what is the first? And the question many of us, we need to ask, is when we bring worship to God, do we give Him our best? Do we give Him our first? Or is worship an afterthought to after we do everything else? We are crowding our lives, and we are crowding our lives with schedules and busyness of things, and we do everything that we want to with our friends and our own desires, and then when we have time, then we do we begin to offer up, God, what is our leftover time and our energy and our intelli in intelligence and our money? Or do we give to him what is the best and the first, setting it apart, saying, God, I really want to give you this. I'm really going to guard this time and this money and this energy really to offer up to you. Because what pleases God is not a worship that is given as an afterthought. Or I have nothing to do on a Friday night. I'm going to go to worship. While God still blesses and meets us there, but what pleases and moves the heart of God is worship that is really intentional and really honoring of Him. And so even when we offer up like five minutes, you know, of prayer, my prayer is always, Lord, let me really just be able to give you best. You know, in, and when we worship, Lord, let me give you with my body what is my best. Lord, I might look really stupid. I have no rhythm, and I look ridiculous when I'm dancing. I understand that. But I'm not ashamed because I do it before the Lord. Because I want to give to him what his rightfully is. And if this is my body, and somehow if my, by dancing and giving him this awkward movement to him pleases his heart, then let it be so. You know? And I remember my friend's brother is um, tone deaf as all get out. Like I never heard anybody sing worse. And, you know, he would sing. The thing about him is that he would sing not, he knew he was tone deaf, but he would sing so loudly. He would sing so, like, from the bottom. It's like, ah, and you're like, please, can you stop? Because you're disturbing everybody's worship. But God is pleased. And that is, <laughs> but that's what we're offering to God, isn't it? You know, we're not doing it for anybody else. We don't do it for, a, you know, approval of anybody around us. We do it because it pleases the heart of the Father. And so when we offer, what we want to give is the best and first. And when we think about our schedule during the week, do we think about worship? Do we kind of really set that apart and say, okay, this is what I'm going to set apart for the Lord. And I'm going to really prepare myself so that when I go to worship, I get to meet my God. I can't wait to meet him. And I can't wait for him to smile at me. And I can't wait for him to just sing songs over me. Is there such an attitude and preparation for worship? Or do we show up because, hey, that's what we do. <laughs> that's what you do. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Welcome back, brother. Missed you, man. Um, 
And so what we offer up to the Lord, and as we see in Abel's offering, it, what offering or worship that God accepts is a worship that is first and best. And not the last and the least. Can we say that? First and best. Amen. <laughs> and so we want to offer him what is first and what is best. And not what is left over. And not what is backwash. Like what Ada offers me. Uh, <laughs> after she... She gargles after brush her teeth. She always offers me the spit and said, Daddy, drink. And I'm like, honey, <laughs> you're so cute. Um, second point is that we see through Abel, Cain and Abel, is that there's worship that God accepts and there's worship that God does not accept. And that's kind of sobering. And this is really important, guys. There's a worship that God accepts and there's a worship that God does not accept. And there is no middle ground. And there's nothing in the middle. There's no kind of worship that kind of God accepts and says, okay, that was good enough. But there's either a worship that God embraces and says, wow, this is good. This is pleasing to me. Or there is worship that God says, this is displeasing to me. Please stop. And one of the things that I think we have to understand for this generation is that we often forget that worship is about God. We often think that worship is about us. And I know you heard this before, but I think it's important to reiterate is that worship is not about us. It's not about you. It's not about how you feel. It's not about how the message was good for your life. It's none of those things. Worship has nothing to do with you. Worship is not about you because we have to get this right. The object of worship is not me. The object of worship is God. I mean, this is... It's really simple for us, right? But it's sometimes we forget. It's not that we are bad, but we just forget because we live in a society where it's, everything is about me and how I feel. And so when we come into worship, we have kind of the same kind of consumeristic mentality. Was this pleasing to me or not? What's that song selection? Do I like that song or do I not like that song? Do I like this man's preaching or do I not like his style? The point is, it doesn't matter. It's not about us. It is all about him. It's what we bring to him in honor and devotion and saying, God, I can't wait to bring you my honor and my offering. I cannot wait to come before you to say, God, I love you with my heart, my body, my intelligence, and my money, and everything that you want is yours. God, I can't wait to bring it to you. And this is all about offering to him what is rightfully his. And this is what worship is. And the overflow of that worship then blesses us, satisfies us. But that's not the point either. The point, success or failure of worship is one criteria. Was God pleased with you? That is the singular point and the absolute only criteria whether or not worship was successful or pleasing. Does this please our God? But for so many of us, because we live in such a consumeristic society where it is about what I feel, I don't feel like worship, who cares? Who cares that you don't feel like worship? God demands worship. And we don't worship him in the way that is pleasing to him. Your worship is not acceptable. 
That's scary. And because, you know, in our culture, one of the, my absolute favorite pet peeves, I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but I hate this. When people come up to me and say, I enjoyed your sermon today. <laughs> Am I a popcorn? It's not about you enjoying the sermon. It's not about whether you was tasteful to you or not, whether you enjoyed it or not. That is absolutely not the criteria. Was your heart moved? Is your heart desiring to know God more? Does your heart desire to follow after him harder after worship? Is your heart changed? Is your life challenged? Do you desire God more? This is what I want to see. I don't care if you like the sermon. I don't care if you illustrations make sense to you. It is not about you. It is offering God what is rightfully his and he deserves all all that we offer him every single time. And I love Isaac because I miss Isaac's way he worships. And I remember when we started, doesn't matter what was going on, Isaac was crying and Isaac was shouting and Isaac was jumping. And, you know, this was every week, every service for months on end. And this was Isaac. And then that worship it doesn't always have to look like that. But in your heart, in your body, in your mind, are you devoting to him what is rightfully his? This is an acceptable form of worship. Everything else is just mere consumerism. God is not a product to be consumed. God do not care whether or not you like the song. God does not care whether you had a bad day. God does not care if you had a bad life. Worship is demanded of us because the truth is this. If you have problems, it's because you have taken your eyes off God. The solution to your problems is not sitting there and saying, God, make me feel better. The solution to it is saying, God, I worship you. And in the worship, what happens is God's power breaks free. It is not what we feel. Let me say that again. It is not what you feel. Your feeling has nothing to do with worship. God will not be mocked. But rebellion of people who are saying, I don't care who you are. I don't feel like it. God deserves more. God desires more. And we need to give him more. Amen. We're called to be a body that knows how to worship. And there's a special grace upon this body, upon you, to be able to worship. It is not about you. It's not about what you feel. It's purely something that we give to God for his glory. Amen? So there's the second point. It's a worship that is acceptable to God. It's, there are times worship that God accepts and there are worships that God doesn't accept. And that depends on whether or not we fully give to him what is rightfully his. And third point that we see from this is that Cain and Abel knew how their worship was received. And this is something that's interesting is that there's a feedback. So if you... Offer to God what is rightfully his. You give to God right worship. If you give to God worship that is to his name, worship that is proper, worship that is pleasing to God, you will know it. If you really give in a genuine worship, when you're on your knees, you're crying out, or when you are really giving your heart and all in all, if you're doing that, you will know because there's something that's going to change within you. In that worship, when you have given all that you can to the all that you know of God, 
then you will experience some kind of transformation in the present. Not later. And people say, what one, what's one worship going to do? That is a lie from hell. One worship can change lives. And we have seen this. One worship has brought people to salvation and brought people to freedom. A single worship has set drug addicts free. A single worship has set young people free from addictions and the grips of death. And a single worship before the living God has brought transformation to an entire a group of people, and we have seen it again and again. And we cannot compromise and take our eyes off each and every single worship because each worship offers an opportunity for the transformative power of God to change a generation. And this is the absolute truth. This is the truth. A single worship. And if you know this is the truth, say amen because I know in this room, this is, we are products of that singular worships. Because if we give to God what is rightfully his, what happens is God's pleasure overflows to us. And that overflow of pleasure and the love of God begins to transform our attitudes, our lives, our hearts, our bodies. If there's need healing, then God will begin to bring healing. If there needs to be a breakthrough, God will bring a breakthrough. If there needs to be a release of oppression, God will bring release of oppression. And God, through singular worship, can transform a situation and circumstance. Amen. And so when we offer to God what is rightfully his, we will experience a transformative power of God as you sit here and you'll feel something begin to shift within you. And the truth is, if you don't feel any shift, if you at the end of the service, all of it, you feel absolutely nothing, you are exactly the same, then you didn't worship. Let me say that again. If you th sit through an entire service and you feel absolutely zero change, that means you did not engage the living God. Because if you engage the living God in worship, it will change you. How dare do we not change? It's impossible. If you see the face of God, that your life doesn't change. If you give what is rightfully his in worship, you will change. We are a living testimony of that very truth. Amen. Moving on. <laughs> Four point. We're going to read verses 5 through 7 of chapter 4. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The point Number four is we must live to worship and we must worship to live. Let me say that one more time. We must live to worship and then we must worship to live. What I mean by that is this. When we see in Scripture God telling Cain, if you did what is good, which was what? Worship. If you render unto God proper worship, then you wouldn't be in this state. But because if you refuse to offer God proper worship, then what we see in Cain's life is that sin was crouching at the door of his life, ready to pounce upon him. And the truth is this. It is in worship where the power 
of God gives us the strength to overcome the enemy. If we look within us and we take a self-examination, we take inventory of our attitude and of our hearts, what we'll see is that there is a long list of things that are going on that is not very pleasant. That is not very good. There's desires in our hearts that we feel we know is not pleasing to the Lord. And we do not have it in our own strength to be able to crush that desire on their foot. For us, if you are failing again and again and again and again in the same sin to the same temptation because there is no proper worship that is being rendered that gives the power for you to overcome that sin. And the converse is true. But we don't just worship and then go on to live our lives according to whatever dictates and desires of our hearts and to do whatever we want. Because sometimes I think because, again, it's a consumeristic mentality, and I know I'm going to beat this horse until it's pulverized, and then we make it into a glue that we chuck it out into the world. Because this consumeristic mentality and identity is absolutely idolatrous, and it is so displeasing to God, as long as this is fundamentally part of our psyche and mindset that is about my desires and my consumption, then we will never, ever be pleasing to God. And so we want to rip it out the very heart of consumerism from the heart of the church. But what this means is that when we have worship sometimes, it is glorious. And I think I was talking to Paul this past Sunday. He said sometimes we hit such heights of worship where we were going so high. Paul was thinking, is this allowed? Is this legal? Is this okay for us to fly this high? Is this like, it feels wrong because it's so much glory. And seriously, right? We've experienced some crazy worship. I mean, just things like, is this really okay, God? You know, is this okay to offer this much glory to us? Is this okay for us to sit with this? But for many of us, we go through that experience and we walk out and the first thing is, hey, I'm going to go to my own thing now. Guys, there is no separation in the way we live our lives and the way we worship. There cannot be. The way we live must be the way we worship. The way we worship must be the way we live. And I was, you know, I was telling the discipleship group today, and I felt really bad. And I, last night, I, um, I had to confess, and I got up, and I just couldn't get this thought out of my head because last night I ordered pizza because, you know, I don't want a pizza. But she wanted chicken katsu and fried chicken all at the same time. She's three and a half. And so she, she wanted all those things. She wanted pizza from Papa John's. She specifically asked. And so we ordered Papa John's, and she says, I don't want it. And so, so I, I, I say, okay, I, I don't go pick it up, right? Because I, I just gave him my number, or I just gave him my name, and I just didn't pick it up. And I, I was like, it's Papa John's, right? I mean, they're billions of dollars. I mean, one pizza is not going to destroy them. So I went, and Ada was like, I'm hungry, Daddy. Buy me chicken katsu. I'm like, okay. So I call Shiki, and, you know, I order chicken katsu, and uh. I just don't feel like going to Shiki and paying $18 for, you know, a fried cutlet, you know? And so it's like, maybe I'll just go to Kroger and we'll buy, we'll buy you a cookie. <laughs> and then you'll be fine. And so we go and buy a, a cookie and, you know, some snacks and save myself $15. And I go home, and I didn't pay for that chicken katsu either. And I start, God started to convict me. And I tried to justify it by saying, you know, shiki, shiki. 
know, sorry. Sorry. Um, but I thought to myself, hey, we, 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 we eaten there enough and you know I started to justify my actions and I got up in the morning the first thought that came to my mind I believe is the spirit of God said spirit of God is saying you sinned <laughs> I was like God I'm so sorry but then God said that's not enough it's not so enough for you to say sorry to me because you created you did an action that cost a merchant something you need to call them and apologize for ordering food that you have no intention of picking up and then pay for the meals. <laughs> I was like, really, God, is that necessary? I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the Spirit of God was really convicting me, and I was like, okay, I'll do it. And so, and I came, um, I was driving to church, and I began to call. Yeah, I shake you first, and hello. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> um, I ordered food, and I didn't pick up. I would love to pay for that meal, please. They're like, what? <laughs> so you, let me get my manager, and so the manager comes up, and she's like, yeah, this is Charlene. Can I help you? Um, I'm sorry. I, my name is Arnold. I, I ordered food yesterday, and I just didn't pick it up because I didn't want to. And uh, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Can I pay for the meal? She started to laugh. And she's like, don't worry about it. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And I called Papa John's. And then I called Papa John's. I'm like, God's oh, favor is on me. But I feel like Papa John's going to charge me. I just know it. I just know Papa John's going to charge me. And I call him. And, you know, and I, I'm like, hey, um, this is Papa John's. Hey, <laughs> this is Arnold. I ordered pizza last night. I didn't pick it up. I'm really sorry. You know, she's like, what? What are you talking about? I ordered pizza last night, and I just didn't feel like picking it up. And so I know you had to waste that pizza. And you couldn't sell it to somebody else, and I'm sorry. I'd like to pay for that pizza. She's like, uh, let me talk to my manager. And, like, I hear, like, a what? Like, in the back, like, what? <laughs> Tell him to don't not worry about it. I'm like, Yes. And so she gets back on. She's like, says, don't worry about it. I'm like, okay, thank you. I hung up. But I know that was favor of God on me. But I think the principle is this, that if there's sin and there's guilt in our lives, that we cannot come into worship with those things hanging over our lives. If you have sinned, if you have known sins throughout the week, and then if you are bringing into that into worship without proper repentance, the truth is God will not receive your worship. And I know that sounds shocking to our evangelical ears. What? Doesn't God's grace cover it? It does. It only covers it if you come before God in, in repentance. In Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1, Isaiah 10, is that right? I don't want to misquote it. Um, I think it's Isaiah 10. I'll, I'll make sure and I'll post it if it's wrong. But in Isaiah 10, it says, God says, stop bringing me worship. Please stop. Because it's really distasteful because your worship is tainted with blood and you're not doing anything I'm asking you to do and yet you keep offering worship again and again and this has got to stop please stop offering worship because it's not pleasing to me and I think this is what we must understand church is that there is no separation in the way we live our lives and the way we worship the way we live must reflect the way we worship. And the way we worship here in the name of Jesus must begin to reflect in the ways that we live our lives. And so we must to go into the world in the same way that we come into the presence of God. There must not be any separation. There must not be any lag. And the very thesis of this church is to take this idea of a retreat 
to, and say, can this experience of a retreat high be replicated in everyday experience? That worship is not just rendered in a genuine way twice a year at a retreat setting, but every day of your life where you are able to come before the presence of God in purity and for him to accept your worship and to be able to walk in that pleasure of God, overflowing, changing the very atmosphere in which you live. And can you begin to live in such a way that there is a genuine transformation, not just of your life, but everywhere you go. And I was talking to Megan this week and this past weekend when she was at home and every time previous times that she went home she felt like she was being crushed by the negativity and the spirit of death that hangs over that family so heavy and she felt like she couldn't have any hope but she knew that she needed to worship and pray into it before she went and so she started praying about her family experience about visiting the family she prayed and prayed and prayed and until she felt like there was a breakthrough and when she went home the entire atmosphere had changed they were like hey megan she's like who are you mom <laughs> Who are you, Dad? What are you guys doing? You know, there's because she begins to carry that presence of worship, the very presence of God, where she goes and begins to change the atmosphere. And this is our thesis. This is our conclusion is that we must become people who carry the very presence of God, not just in a church, not just in a worship setting, not just in a retreat, but every place we touch our feet upon must begin to re be transformed and renewed by the very presence of God that is flowing through you because you are in a state, a constant state of non-disengaged 24 hours online worship with God. And there is this sense of overflow everywhere you go. I'm not saying I'm doing that perfectly. But this is the goal for which we seek after. Amen. This is our goal. The way you go in schools, work, wherever, there must be the presence of God reflected because you carry it in worship. Okay, last point. And it's simple, and it's, but it's maybe the most profound. God doesn't have to accept any of our worship, ever, ever. He is not obligated to receive our worship. He has no need. There's nothing in us that demands that he receives and honors and accepts our worship. But what we see in Abel's offering is that Abel brings death to as animal sacrificing it to the Lord. In the salvific history, this is the most significant point about worship. The way and the only way we're able to enter into worship that glorifies God is through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus allows for us to enter into worship. Because once he's finished on the cross, he goes up into the right hand of God and he's began to intercede for you and for me. And right now, he's interceding, praying for you. It's amazing. And there's nothing in us, as Joyce prayed, there's really nothing good in us. Whereas Yenna prayed, my words are like dust to you, God. But if you so please... And what we hear when we offer up ourselves in that way, Jesus is saying, I am pleased with your words, you know. I am so pleased with your heart, you know. Do you not see that I've died so that I can receive, my Father can receive your words and your prayers, you know. 
This is the way Christ has made a way for us to be able to enter into worship with boldness and confidence. But this is the only confidence we have. We have nothing in us. We have no amount of good works that can bring our access to God, uh, allow for the access to God within and of ourselves. It is only in Christ that allows for us that full, unmitigated, full, unblocked, full, unhindered access to the worship of our God. And it is in Him that we boast. It is in Him that we worship. It is in Him that we celebrate. It is in Him we pray. It is in Him we sing. It is Him we began to say hallelujah. It is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And I'm going to invite the praise band to come. And we're going to practice a genuine worship tonight. Can we do that? First, can we begin with the opposite fifth principle? It is only through Christ that we are able to enter into worship. So if there are known sins, if there are things in our hearts that you, need, you know that you need to be covered by the blood of the Lamb, can we begin to ask for Jesus to cover it in us right now? Say, Lord Jesus, we just come to you tonight, God. There's nothing good in us. There's no amount of activity, Lord Jesus, that gives us the right to worship. There's nothing in us, God, that is worthy of being accepted by you, God. There's no words, God, that we can say, God, that would open up the heaven's door to be able to encounter you face to face, God. And no matter how much we cry out, God, there's absolutely nothing in us. But it is only in the finished work of Jesus that we have access to the Father. It is only in the finished work of the cross, God, that we are able to come into your presence and meet face to face with you. So church, can we begin to really pray? God, cover us by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, help us to be centered in the person of Jesus. Lord, we boast in nothing. Lord, we boast in absolutely nothing in of who we are. Lord, I stand before you having nothing of my own to boast and to bring to you that is pleasing. Only way that I am pleasing to you is when I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. And that, Lord Jesus, I douse myself, I cover myself, I paint myself, I dip myself in the truth of who you are, Jesus. It is your blood, it is your blood, it is your blood that has the access, that gives me the key to the kingdom, that gives me the key to the Father. Lord, it is your blood. And Lord Jesus, we claim that blood tonight. So church, let us begin to claim that blood right now. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that blood. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We cover ourselves right now, Jesus. In the blood of the Lamb. 